Chapter 7. Did you steal our wood? In the autumn dark of that evening, after the children were in bed, I stepped out front and faced the young sentry. No, miss, I'd not steal. There's no profit in it. Captain John Wilson of the 59th found himself before Justice Richard Dana for haranguing the Negroes to cut their master's throats. Good. He deserves it. He's insolent and he needs to be brought down. His blue eyes widened. You know Wilson? I met him by accident. He was most rude to me. Well, I have no fancy for your courts or for the whipping my superiors would order, so I didn't steal your wood. What did Ames do? Who, miss? The one you people shot this morning? Deserter, miss. Felt sorry for the poor bloke. He's a wife back home. Then why did he desert? Cold and hungry, miss. They got to him. They did. Your people. Told him this country is a good place, that a man can own his own land here and do whatever he takes a mind to do if he works hard. Ames was always daft to his own land. They told him no lies. Aye, he nodded. I clutched my shawl around me. It was cold. In the distance on Brattle Square, the campfires flickered in the night, casting eerie shadows. Faceless forms moved between the tents. I heard some soldiers singing softly. The song drifted on the night air. I apologize for yesterday, miss, he said. I stared at him. My commanding officer was watching. I had to do my duty. Well, you did it. I started back up the steps. Miss? I turned. You say a soldier can get work at Gray's rope box works in, this, in his leisure time. Is that true? How would I know? He spoke plain. You live here and you look like a bright sort, smarter than most maid servants. I shrugged. Why would you want to work there? Doesn't the army pay you? The pay is meager, miss. Something, something in the way he said it caught up my mind. You mean you're hungry? We've no bread. The townsfolk won't provide us with anything. Some do. I've heard business is brisk once you people came. For officers' personal needs, miss, there's always some who will provide, but we need things to dress up our basic provisions. For the most part, the town won't sell us anything in large quantity. Well, I suppose you could try, Gray's. Where is it, miss? Across from Commissioner Paxton's house, down near Griffin's Wharf. Thank you, miss. And who made those cinnamon buns you brought home yesterday? I told my friends how just a whiff of them reminded me of home. My own mum made them. Soon as I get some money, I'd like to buy some. The darkness wasn't the only thing getting thick between us, I minded. I felt something in the moment, some kindred feeling take hold. They come from Hill's Bakery, I said. He asked me about the troops and if they were hungry. He didn't answer. Look here, are you hungry? He took a moment, turning away, shifting the musket to the other shoulder. Finally, the answer came, muffled, for his face was still turned. We're not supposed to complain to the townsfolk or bother them for anything. Strict orders. I went into the house. Suki was in her little room and back. In the kitchen, I found two leftover cinnamon buns and wrapped them in a napkin. Don't be a fool, Rachel Marsh, I told myself. Don't start anything you can't finish. My mama had always said that, but what she... But what had she started when she married my father? I thought of what Mrs. Adams had said earlier this day about the big fish swallowing the small. If anybody looked like a small fish, it was that sentry. Matter of fact, he looked like he was already swallowed and spit back up. I hurried through the house before my good sense could get the best of me. Mrs. Adams was in bed, Mr. Adams in his office. Sedition, Mr. Hill had said. You will know it when you do it, Rachel. Well, if this was sedition, I minded, it felt good. Outside, I thrust the wrapped buns into the surprise sentry's numbed hand. The blue eyes widened. Thank you kindly, miss, he said. My name's Rachel, and mine's Kilroy, Private Matthew Kilroy. I wish he hadn't told me his name. It made him a person instead of just a sentry. I put a different light on things. I slammed the door shut, bolted it, and was about to run upstairs when Mr. Adams came out of his office and through the parlor. What is it, Rachel? I stared at him, but did not answer. He was holding a heavy book in his hands and regarded me over it. Was someone at the door? No, sir. My mouth was dry. There were tears in my eyes, and he saw them. He came closer. What's troubling you, Rachel? You look as if you've just seen the devil himself, child. I've just done sedition, Mr. Adams, I blurted out, his eyes widened. Have you now? That's a serious charge you're admitting to. May I ask how? 
I've just gone and given two cinnamon buns to that poor, hungry, cold sentry out there, I wailed. I know you don't like him. I couldn't help it. He nodded slowly. I submit to you, Rachel, that it is difficult for us to shake off our prejudices and habits. What did that mean? That he approved or disapproved? He was oft times long-winded with his lawyer's talk. Even Mrs. Adams said so. Right now, those soldiers, as a body, represent everything we fear and have come to hate, he went on. But they are still our countrymen. I thought of Wilson and the ones I'd met at Mr. Piermont's. My countrymen? Those fops? Not while I had breath in me. Then I brought my mind back to what Mr. Adams had just said. Does that mean you approve of my giving the buns to the sentry? It means that if anyone accuses you of doing sedition with cinnamon buns, I shall defend you in court, gladly. For a lawyer, that was a fine answer. I felt comforted by it as I went to my room. It was cold in my room. Though Luke had found wood that day, he hadn't yet brought any to my hearth. No matter. I put on my warmest nightdress, got into bed, and started reading one of the books I'd gotten from Henry Knox's yesterday. Clarissa, or The History of a Young Lady, by Samuel Richardson. I started reading, but my mind wandered. I thought of the young sentry out in the cold. Was he my countryman, as Mr. Adams had said? Or was he British, and I American? I decided he, cold and hungry, was my countryman, but not the officers, and would ponder it no more. And that is how it started with me and Private Matthew Kilroy. Many times that winter, I found myself doing sedition, sometimes with a piece of smoked turkey, or some stale cake, or bread. Matthew Kilroy continued to be grateful, and I became better than ever at lying to myself. I told myself I was feeding him because he was my countryman, or because he was young and away from home and near starving. In November, Mr. Hill became the official baker of the 14th and 29th regimes, so the soldiers weren't starving for long, but I kept bringing Matthew buns and bits of food and bread. What you bring is better than anything Mr. Hill supplies us with, he told me one dark night. Mr. Hill brings for two regimes. You bring just for me. I blushed at that, and I kept right on lying to myself. I did not admit to myself that it was because Matthew's blue eyes pleasured me that I kept sneaking food to him, or because when he smiled, it was like he was sharing a secret with me, or because he had a dimple on one side of his face, or because he waited for me at our front steps. One night, our hands touched accidentally as I gave him the food. He blushed and asked forgiveness. That tore at me. So did his pleasant and respectful manner. Such things tore at places inside where I had not heretofore known that I had places. Oh, I was becoming sensible of my feelings, but I did not understand them. In my jumbled and lying mind, I understood that they had to do, in a roundabout way, with the fact that no man had ever waited at the front steps for me before in my life. One especially windy night, my mob cap blew off my head. He ran to fetch it, brought it back, and stared at me. Your hair's beautiful, he said. It had come undone and tumbled about my shoulders. It's so dark and shining. I got it from my Protestant burning French father, and I found myself telling him about my father. I had not told anyone about him before. I have no more love for the Frenchies than any proper Englishman, my own father was killed in, by one of your French wars. You may be part French, but you're bonnie, Rachel Marsh. The wives and sweethearts of the men of the 14th and 29th and 59th just landed, and I've seen some of them. And you're more bonnie than any. Has your sweetheart come? I asked. I have no sweetheart, he sighed. Who would have me? The unanswered question hung in the sparkling night, clear as a star in front of the eyes of both of us. I was sure that no one in the house except Suki knew what I was about in those cold November days. Every night, Suki left a plate of leftovers on the kitchen table and said nothing in the morning when it was gone. Suki, how like her to know and say nothing, to leave the food. Suki knew better than any of us what it was to be hungry, I minded. I remembered the Adamses speaking of her past. Why hadn't I paid attention? All I knew was that it had not been good. One night, I came into the kitchen as she was cleaning up, and there was the plate, covered with a napkin. Suki, thank you, I said. She turned. You like the roast? Mr. Adams said it was the best I'd ever cooked. Thank you for the food you leave every night. You know who I give it to, don't you? She scowled and shrugged. Don't matter to me. I give it to that sentry, Suki. He's cold and hungry. 
You be careful, was all she would say. I will. I know his superiors wouldn't like it. I ain't talking about him, she said contemptuously. Talking about you. Be careful. Of what, Suki? The whites of her eyes grew larger. You don't know? Maybe you better stop giving the food, was all she would say. But she left, still left it on the table every night. By mid-November and the first snowfall, all the troops were quartered, finally, in distilleries, warehouses, and sail lofts all over town. Two companies of the 29th, one of them Matthews, were put in the sugar warehouse on Brattle Street. But he still came, every night at dusk, to do sentry duty in front of our house. I'm so glad they found quarters, Mrs. Adams said as the house settled the night, the first night Brattle Square was empty of troops. Those poor things were freezing out there. I know quartering them is against the Magna Carta, but somehow that all seemed unimportant the worse the wind blew. She sighed. There is much I have yet to know. Americans are supposed to be a very religious people. Would to heaven they were in earnest. Sometimes I fear they are only a less vicious people than others. She sat in the easy chair. I brought her tea. Mr. Adams had gone to a meeting at Henderson Inch's house. But that young sentry is still out there, Rachel. It's his nightly duty. All the sentries in Boston are from the 29th. I said. She accepted the teacup and looked at me with innocent brown eyes. You've become friends with him, haven't you? I could not lie to her. Yes, ma'am. Be careful, Rachel, was all she would say. In the next moment, she asked me about my reading. I'm reading Roland's Ancient History, I told her. Mr. Knox suggested it. She told me how fond she'd always been of that book. Then we talked of other books. It was almost as if she were trying to remind me of my vow to better myself. By the time December came, with its howling winds and snow and fat icicles dripping from the eaves and from the masts of the British ships in the harbor, Dr. Joseph Worm had advised Mr. Adams to send for Dr. James Lloyd. He was an obstetrician and the first doctor in America ever to deliver babies. It was unheard of. Suki shook her head. Midwives bring babies, not doctors, much less he be a man. But Dr. Warren recommended him highly, Suki, I told her, and Mr. Adams wants the best for his wife, and Lloyd was trained in England, and Dr. Warren said he was scientific. Don't care what he be, Suki grumbled. He be a man. That ain't men's business. Don't care how scientists he be. Mrs. Adams is educated and far-reaching in her thinking, I told her. She grunted. Sooner or later, all that book reading will get a woman into trouble, and she gave me a meaningful glance. But I admired Mrs. Adams for her courage. Lloyd was duly sent for, and soon he was making regular visits to the house. He had the biggest nose I'd ever seen on a man, and the kindest face. As December progressed, the household was in a flurry of activity. There was the morning room to be made ready. Mrs. Adams would use a spare bedroom. The cradle must be cleaned and polished and lined with the softest of fleecy flannel. Suki prepared special dishes for Mrs. Adams. I felt strangely removed from all the fuss though I helped. Mrs. Adams had difficulty sleeping night and was uncomfortable most of the time. She would sit in the easy chair in the parlor, dazed, with an open book in her lap, but most of the time she just stared into space. I worried about her, and I longed for someone to talk to about Matthew. I know it was selfish of me to think of him when I should have been thinking of my mistress, but I thought about him all the time. I hoped he was warm enough at night in the sugar warehouse. I minded those blue eyes and how they smiled at me. I looked at myself in my bedroom mirror with a good look for the first time. Was I pretty, like Matthew said? My waist was slim, my bosom respectable, my chin pert, my, my eyes large and blue, but my skin tended to freckle, and except for my hair, I had always considered myself plain. I'd never considered myself with appearance before. Now it was all I thought about when I wasn't thinking of Matthew. And it seems I thought of Matthew all the time. I daydreamed about him. I went over and over in my head things he had said to me and how he had laughed, how he tilted his head, how his voice came to me across the dark and moved things around in my soul. I looked forward to his arrival in front of the house every night with an eagerness that surprised me. Nabby and Johnny would watch for him too. It became a game with them. They would stand at the front windows every evening as dusk fell and the candles were lighted and one or the other would shout, Soldier here! and my heart would start to race as I pulled them from the window to come to supper. Then I would glimpse Matthew as he began his sentry's walk, up and down, the slow measured gait, the musket on his shoulder, the way he turned on his heel and started back, and something would catch in my throat. 
His form, outlined in the half-dark, etched something on my mind, tugged at something in my memory that I could not name. My spirit felt a kinship with him. I became alive, as I'd never been before, in his presence. One night, the week before Christmas, Matthew gave me a small packet wrapped in burlap and tied with a bit of blue ribbon. The night was bright and cold. Stars lit the sky. I brought a steaming mug of hot cider and some apple cake out for him. He warmed his hands on the mug, then set it aside to hand me the packet. Open it, he urged. I did so. It was a book. Pamela. Oh, Matthew, I love it so. I do. I clutched the book to my breast and looked up at him. I've been wanting this very book. However did you know? I went to Henry Knox's store. I told him I knew you. He suggested it. Tears came to my eyes. When was the last time I'd had a present from anybody? I could not recollect. Why are you crying? Matthew asked. I shrugged. He took my hand in his. Rachel, I would like to see you more. I was taken back. You see me every night. I know, but I'm on duty and you have to sneak out. I'd like to see you in the day. I scarcely know what you look like by sunlight. Are you as beautiful as now? I laughed. I was trembling. What a silly question, Matthew. Anyway, I'm not beautiful. I'm plain compared to the likes of Susie Chef. She's the prettiest girl in Boston. Everyone says so. I don't care what everyone says. You are beautiful. I blushed, grateful for the shadows. Heavens, I don't know what to say to that. Say you'll walk out with me on your day off. I'll try to get my day off changed. I'll arrange it. I might get in trouble with the Adamses. Do they tell you what to do on your day off? No, but if they found out I was walking out with somebody without their permission, let alone a British soldier, I don't know how it would sit with them. I'm accountable to them, Matthew, about my behavior, I mean. He scowled. Sometimes I don't understand you people at all. What people? he asked. You Americans, you make such a fracas out of knowing your own minds and not being told what to do. And here I ask you just to walk out with me and you behave as if you have to ask permission from Parliament about it. Matthew Kilroy, I never said I had to ask anyone, and I do know my own mind. I've been on my own since I was 12 years old. I know what I want better than any girl my age. Then apparently what you don't want is to walk out with me. I didn't say that. Then you will walk out with me? He was so earnest, so dear, and so close to me. I was leaning back against the house, and he was in front of me, one hand holding mine, the other just over my shoulder, pressed against the house. His musket was propped up next to me. For a moment, I thought he was going to kiss me. He was bending down so close. Overhead, stars twinkled, and windows all up and down the street, candles glowed, but none gave a light so mellow or warm as Matthew's eyes. Yes, I said weakly. I'll walk out with you, but I must go in now. It's late. So, we're going to walk out together once a week, I told Jane the next day. She'd stop by with a cinnamon cake for Christmas. We were sipping tea, alone, in our kitchen. Be careful, she said, or you'll be following Susie's chef and Molesworth down the aisle. They plan to marry in spring. It isn't like that, Jane. It's not romantic. It's a friendship. You've read enough of Henry Fielding by now to know better, she chided. Where is this leading? Have you considered that question? Must I? She sighed. Yes, I'm afraid you must. I don't want to, I said. Not right now. I just want to enjoy Matthew's friendship. Why can't I? I've never had a man for a friend before. She sipped her tea and eyed me carefully. Dear Rachel, there is no such thing as a man friend. She pronounces with the same smug knowledge she displayed when telling me about the secret meetings of the Sons of Liberty. There isn't? No. A man can't be a friend to a woman. Why? It just can't be. I thought I'd come close to it with Henry Knox. Has he ever told you your hair is beautiful? No. He doesn't say things of that nature. What do you talk about? Books? Ah, a safe subject. That's why you're friends. If he started talking about your hair, if you started noticing the dimple in his face, Henry Knox doesn't have a dimple in his face. You know what I'm saying, Rachel Marsh. Don't be dense. What are you saying, I asked. Say it plain. She brought a copy of the Tory newspaper, the newsletter and weekly advisor ad advertiser. Instead of explaining, she opened the newspaper and showed me an ad in it, taken out by an anonymous British officer. Wanted to live with two single gentlemen, a young woman to act in the capacity of housekeeper, and who can occasionally put her hand to anything. 
Extravagant wages will be given and no character required. Any young woman who chooses to offer may be further informed at the Royal Coffee House. We laughed over the advertisement. Then she grew solemn. You see what I mean? She asked. Jane, how can I compare my friendship with Matthew to that? She sipped her tea. I told you in high esteem, Rachel Marsh, she said. I value your friendship, but I must tell you something. I felt dread in my bones. Tell them. There's a word around that Kilroy is a scamp. What does that mean? That even in the 29th, which is full of scamps like Molesworth, he's a bounder. They say he's robbed a Boston woman of almost all her outside clothing. I went red in the face. You'll be no more friend of mine, Jane, if you say such about him. I know, Matthew, he's decent. She sighed. I had to tell you, of course, lots of what they say is a rumor, but be careful, please. I don't want to see you give your heart to a bounder. She was the third person to bid me be careful with Matthew. No need for you to worry about that score, Jane. I'll never give my heart to a bounder. Many women have said such. Do you think they set out to do it? It just happens. With blue eyes like he has, what chance have you? I'm going to better myself and become educated before I give my heart to anyone, I told her. Good, she said, but I have a feeling she did not believe me. Late in December, Mrs. Adams' baby was born. Dr. Lloyd stayed all night. It was bitter cold with winds whipping off the bay. Mr. Adams had Luke bringing wood in all night. Suki and I stayed up, keeping coffee brewing in the kitchen. The tea was all gone. We waited hours for that baby, but it just wouldn't be born, it seemed. Then finally, we heard its wail, thin as the morning sun coming through the windows, a girl. Suki said the doctor wouldn't get it to breathe right away, but he had to work on it for a while. The winter days passed in what seemed a half-light, one colder than the next, darkness descending by four in the afternoon. All I remember was the cold and baby Susanna's weak crying, and Mrs. Adams dragging herself around the house, trying to get her strength back. It was not a good winter. If it hadn't been for Matthew, who came to do his sentry duty each evening at dusk, I don't know what I would have done. No matter how cold, I'd sneak out to see him each night then run to bed where I'd bundle under my quilt and listen to the wind under the eaves and hear Mrs. Adams walking the floor with the baby and hear little Susanna's weak cry and shake with fear inside me. For what? I did not know. I could not name my fear. And that is the worst kind I have come to know. Nameless. It takes on the names and faces of all who are dear to us. I prayed for spring.